Very good. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Neetha Dick, and I have the privilege of serving as the Dean of the College of Nursing at the University of Manitoba. As a member of CASM's Research and Scholarship Committee, I'm delighted to welcome you to the February session of the 2020-21 Lunch and Learn series. Before we begin, I have a couple of housekeeping items. Today's session will begin with a presentation from our speaker, and we'll conclude with a 15 to 20 minute Q&A. We will take questions after the presentation. To submit a question, please use the question and answer chat function on your screen. And once you finish typing the question, just remember to hit send. I'm sure many of us are familiar with the concept of lunch and learn, where faculty members come together during their lunch hour to share with one another the projects they're working on and to dialogue and discuss methodologies, successes and challenges they've encountered in their work. This webinar series is intended to serve as inspiration and a networking opportunity for participants while recreating the collegial feel of the lunch and learn. In this fifth session of the 2020-21 series, we will hear from Linda Silas, president of the 200,000 strong Canadian Federation of Nurses Union since 2003. As the dynamic and charismatic leader of one of Canada's largest nurses organizations, Linda is recognized as the foremost advocate on behalf of nurses in Canada. Having fine-tuned her skills as a union leader at local, provincial, national, and international levels over the course of two decades, Linda is a passionate speaker whose straight talking in both official languages inspires nurses and earns the respect of policymakers and stakeholders. Linda's favorite public speaking engagements are always with students as she believes that mentoring the next generation of activists is an important responsibility we all share. Former president of the New Brunswick Nurses Union, Linda is a graduate of the University of Moncton, where she earned a Bachelor of Science in Nursing and has practiced in the ICU, emergency and labor and delivery settings. Linda believes healthcare, like education and decent work, is a human right. She embodies the CFNU model where knowledge meets know-how. Linda's session is entitled Mental Disorder Symptoms Among Nurses in Canada, Risk and Resilience. Linda will present results of a 2019 online pan-Canadian survey of nurses' operational stress injuries, which details the prevalence and root causes of nurses' mental disorder symptoms, as well as help-seeking behavior amongst nurses. Linda will share the implica implications of these results for Canada's health system with special consideration for its impact on nurses' mental health in today's COVID-19 context. So to hear more about this work, I'll turn the session over to Linda to begin her presentation. There, thank you, uh, Nada. As I was saying at the beginning, uh, I have a bad habit of looking at the chat while I'm talking. And when you were talking, I was looking at the chat and we have a Lori from Regina and a Lori from Halifax. So un gros bonjour uh, to all of you. Uh, let me do some magic here and share the screen to see if it will go well. Share, look at that there. I think it's working. And if the slide change, it'll be a perfect. First, a uh, gros merci, a big thank you to all of you for the invitation uh, to cause into the invitation. We've been working in collaboration for, for years and years. Uh, and we'll talk more, but as I was talking to Aneta earlier, uh, a lot of our work started in the 1990s. Uh, some of you might remember when the schools of nursing were closing across Canada and how that was going to impact our health human resource. Now we're in 2021 and we're probably going to be talking about the same thing, but uh, oh, it didn't go this way there. A little bit of who CFNU is. Well, uh, yes, I'm a, a registered nurse. I'm proud of it, uh, but I'm also a, one of Canada. I think it's the seven largest goon, union goon in the country. I represent close to 200 uh, nurses uh, across Canada. Why we say 200? It's because of the Canadian Nursing Student Association. Their membership fluctuate, and they're also a membership that don't pay uh, dues to CFNU. 
They're there to learn, they're there to give their opinion and to help us shape the future of a nursing workplace because that's what we do. It's about collective uh, bargaining, it's about um, uh, safety in the workplace, it's about safe staffing and it's about a better society and I won't go there. But we have eight member organizations that do pay dues from uh, the United Nurses of Alberta, Ontario Nurses Association, PI, New Brunswick, Manitoba, Nova Scotia, Saskatchewan, and Registered uh, Nurses Union of uh, Newfoundland and Labrador. So first, I'm in Ottawa right now. I spend during this pandemic half my time in Mi'kmaq territory in New Brunswick, and now I'm in uh, uh, Ottawa on the unceded uh, territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. Okay. This study, and I think that's uh, probably the most important thing we have to remember, it was done pre-COVID uh, and why. So I'm gonna talk a bit about why we did the uh, study. I, it was, everyone was talking about the mental health of nurses. We were doing an overtime and absenteeism report. Uh, the first one that was done was in 2001, then 2003, and every two years after that, we did an overtime and absenteeism report. We reported to the governments of the world that uh, about a billion dollars was spent a year in sick time and in overtime. And you had to question your, and not in and in both, a billion in both. And you had to question what was happening to our system, what was happening to the absenteeism. A lot of the absenteeism were around mental health issues. So we start talking with different scientists. And in about, oh, what was it? Two, right there, it's 2000 and uh, no, 18. It was about 2015. The federal government sponsored the University of Regina, a big fund uh, held uh, through Dr. Nick Carlton uh, to study the mental health disorders of uh, public safety uh, personnel, which are police, fi uh, fire, not firefighters, police, security, military, uh, and paramedics. And we were saying, but how come you're not studying nurse, nurses? How come you're not going further than that? We've been showing you the impact on nursing. But the key there was that a lot of the personal protective they always mix them up. Uh, per, personal, sir, uh, Linda, anyway, the police, military, et cetera, that group of worker were very uh, high into PTSD. And uh, for PTSD, there wasn't much research done for nurses, for women in general. The Manitoba Nurses Union did a study on PTSD for nurses. And what we realized is as women, because still our population is over 90% uh, female, as women, we were so showing different signs of PTSD. A lot of the signs for women would be uh, similar to burnout, mental, uh, mental health issues, depression, uh, tiredness, compared to the male population, they'd be seeing, uh, they'd be vi visualizing, they'd be, uh, imagining stuff, non-sleep, et cetera, maybe a little bit more violent issues. So we went to Dr. Carlton and said, we need to look at and find a diagnostic, find a way to look at nurses themselves and their mental health disorders. Well, we couldn't get any funding. So one thing we learned is there are amazing PhDs out there and amazing PhDs out there that if they work under the umbrella of a, uh, a full-fledged uh, professor, they can do the study. So Nick hired Andrea Silnecki who, to do the uh, report for us and under his umbrella, under his team. They used the same tools and went. Our job was only a recruitment of participants. Uh, it wasn't to go any further than that because they were the scientists, they were the experts uh, in the mental health disorders and they needed to go further. So what we saw is we had a one of the largest survey ever done uh, 
from nurses, and there were every categories of nurses, nurse practitioner, registered nurse, uh, LPNs or RPNs in Ontario, uh, and registered psychiatric nurses. As you can see across the country, the numbers varies. It's normal that Ontario, Alberta, BC had the highest population or the, the highest respondents because that's the highest level of, uh, of uh, our population. Uh, if you look at Quebec, I don't understand why it was only 2.7 in Quebec. Um, maybe it's because they're not members of CFNU, but we engaged association, we engage everyone else, but the uh, numbers were very uh, low there. So in the participants, we have 7,358. 7, and uh, very clear because if you didn't finish, there was about a 2,000 uh, nurses that did not finish the survey. I uh, tested the survey. Uh, I have to tell you, uh, it wasn't your regular survey. It took a minimum of two hours to fill. A lot of our members had to stop and come back to it, not only for the time, but there were four different tools examining burnout, uh, major depression, anxiety, and, and others. And the tools were grilling uh, and asking you to find examples of, you know, if you were witnessing a child's death, if you were witnessing violence in the workplace. And those, so it was really grilling for uh, these nurses to answer and complete it. So I'm very thankful to these over 7,000 nurses. So if you look at the little chart there, the registered nurses, of course, 81% uh, answered it. And that represents about our population of uh, nurses across uh, the country. The year of experience, again, the bulk is from five years and on. Very interesting that over thir uh, 20 years, sorry, it's over 30, uh, over 33% uh, that responded to the uh, survey. So we're very proud of that. And uh, the scientists, both uh, Nick and Andrea, are still using uh, the study now to further their, their own research in this domain. So if you look at the areas of nursing, again, uh, represents what we were. Uh, the majority of the nurses, about 70% of us work in the acute care sector. And then you have a little bit of representation in every other sector and that continued. So I had to chuckle when my uh, team at CFNU did the PowerPoint and they put this as the results. Uh, there's no smiley faces in any of the uh, results. So I'll jump right to the results right away. So if you look at, uh, this is a snapshot of the four, five different mental uh, disorders that were studies, the PTSD. So if you look at the uh, light blue is uh, nurses, the dark blue is general population and the purple is the uh, protective service personnel. So by looking at that, you can easily see that the light blue uh, line is higher than anybody else, especially the general public, but it is higher than police officers, military, et cetera, in certain areas. So for PTSD, it's about the same. You look at the major depressive disorders, which is depression, Again, uh, uh, about 10% higher than police officers. Anxiety orders, uh, again, higher, uh, about what, 14% higher than the general public. And panic disorder, 20%, um, 3% for the general public and about 9% for the uh, police officers, et cetera. Uh, the alcohol uh, use disorder, uh, that was uh, lower than police officers, about the same as the general public. So when I got the preliminary report, which was in December uh, 19, they, re they were finishing off their report, they made a presentation to me, I, I was sick to my stomach. I just thought, we can't even publish this because we're trying to work to build a retention recruitment strategy. We need to improve our workplace. How can I tell new students? How can I tell new graduates that they have a higher level of major depression than anybody else? Uh, you know, about three, four times higher than the general public, the anxiety orders, PTSD, et cetera. How can I deal with that? 
And I have to say, Dr. Carlton had to have a lot of discussion, probably therapy session. He's a psychologist by a profession uh, with me and say, look, you need to be able to show the picture to be able to fix the picture. And for us and to talk to nurses, because you'll see later on, nurses don't go uh, search for any help. So that was a big problem by itself. This was the scary one, suicidal uh, behavior. Again, if you look, the blue line is nurses, uh, the orange line is general population, and police officers, et cetera, are the green line. Uh, thinking about uh, suicide, 33%. Planning it, 17%. Attempt, 8%. Again, those are of those that answered uh, the questionnaire, but still we had a high number of answered the questionnaire. Uh, scientifically, Dr. Carlton and his team stands be behind these numbers. Uh, what we couldn't do is divide them up, except for Alberta and Ontario, divide them up by province because the numbers were getting too small there. But for us as nurses, what even scares us the most is, let's be honest, uh, we know how to do it. So when we're talking about suicidal behavior, we have to really take these numbers and ask our question, why? I do apologize because I have no idea what the, uh, the, the third last lines are uh, on the slides. It looks like they put two slides together, but uh, no one was in the office this morning to help me there. Years of experience. Uh, again, we're seeing the whole anxiety, which would be uh, the third GAD, general anxiety disorder, a lot higher in the younger years. Kind of makes sense. Uh, but, uh, you know, I look at 10 to 20 years, it's still at 29%. We're looking at major depression it, uh, symptoms. It's across the line and very high, getting higher in the uh, last. Uh, and those are issues we need to look at uh, again closely. Hopefully we'll have a time to, uh, to discuss how. Workplace setting, uh, it's, it's more or less the same thing everywhere. Uh, except home care, long-term care. And again, I want to remind you, these are pre-COVID numbers. They were all done from uh, January, uh, I think it even started in December 18 to uh, August 19. Uh, long-term care, home care was a very stressful environment and that shows it. So when we tell government uh, we've been telling you the staffing issues, the violence issues in long-term care, home care being there forever. Uh, here's some proof. But again, numbers are high uh, a little bit uh, ev everywhere here. Uh, so uh, again, uh, the one that was scaring me uh, the most uh, was su suicidal behavior. Uh, you look at the planning uh, the thinking about it, the attempt, uh, less than one year experience, very high, one to five years, again, very high, uh, five to 10, very high, 10 to 30, very high. You know, we have to ask ourselves, um, what are we going to do with it? That's over a lifetime. In the past year, so that would be, you know, if you're looking at uh, 2018, uh, the numbers are a little bit lower, which is good because it's fresher. I guess if somebody asks you, have you ever thought in your lifetime, and one of the questions was something around that, don't quote me, please. If you ever thought about suicide, 40%, uh, you might be saying yes. Uh, in the last year, it's a lot fresher from Dr. Carlton explains to me. It's a lot fresher so you remember it more concretely and it's more those numbers that uh, we look at. So for us as a union, as an organization, we really have to find ways to, to balance work and life a lot better. And that's over the uh, spread of the, uh, the um, career plan. Work setting, um, again, more or less the same. Uh, here, a, kind of a blitz in long-term care, again, pre-COVID, I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why, you know, it's the working condition. Uh, 
This is a slide that uh, I know for a nurses unions association, we've been talking about it for the last 20 years. Our first campaign at CFNU for uh, to stop violence in the workplace was in 1991. Imagine, we're 2020. One, and we're still talking about violence in the workplace. We're working with the federal government to change the criminal act, to make it an automatic assault, to have signs like you have in taxi drivers. Uh, if you think about New York City, if you assault this taxi driver, it's a criminal, automatic criminal assault. It makes you think twice. We need the same kind of healthcare. Of course, that's when it happens. We have to work on the prevention, but the physical assault, uh, tr most traumatic exposure was 92% of the respondent. Death of, the, of an individual after extraordinary efforts were made to save their life were at 88, 89. Anybody working in the ER doing CPR. Um, my years in the emergency rooms, uh, rooms, emergency room, you know, I still can remember that traumatic CPR on a young woman with a skidoo accident. Um, th how did it impact me? How I think that being able to talk about it, and, and I'm not gonna go into a deep, deep analysis here, but we all remember that first that, uh, that was so traumatic. Uh, because some are peaceful debt, some are almost beautiful debt, and you remember those, but they hit you differently. If I think of the first physical assault I had, I was a nursing student working in a psychiatric hospital and got punched, and literally, I was blue from my neck to my belly button, completely blue on one side. Imagine that on a 20, uh, probably I was 20, 21 years old. I remember that like it was yesterday. Every nurse in the country has those two, at least those two kinds of stories they can talk about. And they need to talk about it, but they don't. And then the deaths of someone who reminds you of a friend and family, 80, uh, 86%. I'm not gonna go into those details. I have to do the presentation. But uh, these three key areas in the general public, when you are physical, physically assaulted, when you see and you work for a paramedic, for example, on trying to save a life, or you see or you go to a funeral parlor and somebody that looks at your family, these are the three more critical issues that will cause either PTSD or depression or anxiety. And we see them all the time. Stress, uh, again, been talking about that forever, not enough staff. And for Dr. Carlton and his team to say, it can't be Linda, that the number one was violence in the workplace, the second was not enough staff. When you think that we're not able to provide the care we were educated to do because not enough staff, too many non-nursing staff, et cetera, et cetera, are there. If you look at um, the question with the uh, circle, is the regular core health staff sufficient or appropriate to meet the needs of patients? 83.4 said no. That's nurses, and they didn't see this as a union survey. And I wanna uh, stress this, this was a University of Regina uh, tool that took over two hours to analyze. These are just snippets in there. So it wasn't a union tool. It wasn't Linda Silas is asking at a rally, do you think that uh, you're understaffed? And of course they all stand up and yes, this was a survey scientifically done by the University of Regina saying the same thing we've been doing. So if I look at burnout and everyone's talking burnout, I do apologize to all of you who are doing extra uh, research and burnout is the topic of the day. I'm apologizing because when the pandemic started, everyone and their dog wanted us to do a study on PPEs. I couldn't, I couldn't even handle the emails I was getting. And I was at first, oh yeah, that's interesting. Oh yeah, then realizing it was the new shiny toy. Now it's burnout. And there are so many studies out there on burnout because of the pandemic. 
Uh, we will be able to compare them to this. You as scientists will be able to compare it to this. But you know the signs and we all have them. You know, we're not super women or super nurse here. We all have them. Some mornings you wake up, you don't have any energy. You can't think clearly. You're, you say your batteries are dead and all that. When we look at uh, for, for our own membership, you know, 70, not 72, 63% have some signs of burnout. Okay. Close to 30% are at the clinical level. That means they should be consulting with a nurse practitioner, a physician, a psychologist. They probably should be into treatment. That's 30% of those who answered the survey. Again, my friends, I wanna remind you that this is pre-COVID. So if we look at, uh, are they asking for help? It's simple, they're not. Their best friend or their family member is where they're asking for help. And then I remember in my years as a nurses union administrator at NBNU, I used to get the calls from our staff, our labor relations staff that would deal with the long-term disability or the workers' compensation. Linda, this nurse really doesn't want to go see a psychiatrist or a psychologist, and he or she's going to lose their, um, lose their benefits. And I had to get on the phone with them and say, do you need money at the end of the month? Can you pay your bill? If you want to continue on either long-term disability, workers' compensation, you need to seek help. And these are the help that you need to see. And as you can see, nurses still, 20 years later, are still in that loophole of if I need help, mm, I'd rather stay close to my bubble. And don't worry, they don't go see their unions or they don't go see their employers either. They don't even go see a, uh, one of their colleagues. It's family members and friends. So we have to work. And look at the bottom of my chart. I, I circled it on my paper copy to make sure I don't forget. But 20, almost 26%, don't go see anybody. So what did COVID do? Well, these stats are coming with the Carol uh, mid-January. So they're about a month old. Uh, we had over 66,000 infection. That's 10% of total case. We had 40 deaths, one uh, RN, uh, one LPN, two doctors, and the rest were mostly personal care workers. So as a society, as a workforce, we have to ask ourselves, okay, what happened? Why did personal care workers are the ones dying? Uh, more are the ones getting the more infection. We know the majority are long-term care, home care, but still, uh, we've had to negotiate point of care risk assessment. When you think in an occupational health and safety environment, uh, nobody has to negotiate safety. Nobody uh, should be asking to have the proper PPEs to do their job. In nursing, we had to do. And what that is gonna cost for all the scientists listening is the moral injury and the PTSD and increased burnout, of course. And that's where we're seeing the scientific community of nursing and others looking at right now. For me as a union, I'll take that information, but we need to dramatically work on the health human resource strategy and bring a better balance. So since uh, January, 2020, uh, but I mentioned it earlier, uh, we had to fight for uh, PPEs. And, uh, you know, I think my team put a pretty picture there. Uh, we should have put the picture uh, of the nurse and personal care workers in garbage bags. Uh, and that's what they were wearing in some of the long-term care facilities in Ontario to protect themselves. Uh, that... Uh, this period, and it looks like 2021 will be as bad, at least today, we're not fighting for the PPEs. Employers are not locking them out. We still have employers shaming nurses, and they're often shaming the registered nurse, like, oh, you're trying to stir up trouble for those N95s. Let's be clear, my friends, this virus is airborne. It's aerosolized. If you don't believe me, watch TV when the, the president of the United States goes out, he's double masked now. 
Underneath is an N95, over is a surgical mask. Like we have to think with our health, it's airborne and we have to protect our healthcare workforce towards it. Uh, you probably would have heard me. We would never ask a firefighter to jump in the fire without the proper protection, but we're asking our healthcare workforce to do it. So I mentioned it earlier, but uh, studies and studies are going to be come out, uh, coming out on the mental health of the pandemic. And uh, we need to work with it, but we mostly need to change it. Again, uh, more, um, more research here, more report. You can go on our website. Every nurse's website now has a section, Nurses Union's website, a section on your well being, your, your mental health. So those are interesting tools. But this is going on internationally. I've never, and uh, Neta and I have been quite fortunate. We've uh, seen each other in different countries over the world at ICN uh, meetings. And I have to say, uh, ICN has done an amazing job around the protection, the safety protection of nurses globally. Uh, and the, you know, it started and started way before them, but they took a real lead and it's quite uh, impressive to see. Because the shortage and the potential high shortage of nurses will be and is a uh, global issue. So what do we do? How do we build resilience to our members, to our healthcare system? The first thing we did, like many organization, we lobbied the federal government, we lobbied, we lobbied, we lobbied. First was on PPE and then it was hitting us in the face. Nurses are bur burning out. As I was saying to Netta earlier, uh, we have to realize that those of us, like I'm working home, most of you are working at home, it's a pain in the butt. I hate it with a passion, I miss people, but I'm not jumping into the fire like our members are jumping into the fire. We realized quickly that working under emergency measures, and I've been a union president for a thousand years, in all our collective agreement, there's always that little uh, paragraph, in case of emergency, the employer might change the rules of the games of a collective agreement. We all put that because there were, if there was a disaster, if war would fall on us, you know, 9-11, uh, et cetera, that you knew that if that happened, like a pandemic, you, the rules of the games would change. Nobody expected the rules of the games to change for a year. And it might be more. So you're looking at these nurses, at these workers, uh, vacation were almost nil for the last year. Don't you dare call sick time if it's not uh, associated to symptoms of COVID, uh, trying to take a mental health rate, an education session, try to change jobs. Because as we all know, when you're tired in one unit, just go and get refreshed, re-educated into a new unit. It's, it's the best. You know, it's what nursing as a profession is so rich. None of that. And never mind that. Your employer can ask you at any time. I'm a critical care nurse. I work with my team. I'm very happy. No, sorry. We need you on the COVID unit. Or no, sorry, we need you in the ER. Or no, sorry, we need you uh, in the long-term care facility down the road. Most province work with a volunteer. I had to volunteer to go to the long-term care down the road that needed me. But some did. But all of them were working under emergency measures. So anyway, all this to say that now we're seeing more people starting to realize and studying that. So the first thing we did, uh, we partnered with Health Canada, the Wellness Together uh, Canada. If you're not on their, uh, their website and with their, uh, they don't have an app there, but it's all web-based and you can do your own exercise, et cetera, I encourage you to do it because it's quite impressive. Uh, they've regrouped three different uh, groups that helps community like the Kids Helpline because it's not only for nurses, it's for the general public. We're working with them to build a peer-to-peer -peer session because what we're realizing, remember when I went back, uh, nurses don't want to ask for help. They ask their friends, their families. 
We have to find some kind of peer-to-peer -to, -peer to help them to ask for help. So we're working with that. Guarantee you it's not my expertise, so I'm not working on that. But part of my team are looking at specific tools. But I personally was very impressed with the easiness and how it could adapt to my whole family and friends and going from there. So we'll continue there. What we uh, did, and you probably heard uh, of the Time of Fear report, how Canada failed their healthcare workers and mismanaged the first wave of the pandemic. And now we're about, as you all saw the graphs, we're about to get out of the second wave of the pandemic. And uh, we did uh, as bad or worse. Um, so it'll be quite interesting uh, if we're gonna come out with a new report. But here was really with the first wave, it came out in October, was really to talk about, we needed to bring safety into the workplace, the proper PPE. Paid sick time for their workers, presumptive legislation adopted it. Presumptive legislation just means like firefighters, most uh, lung cancer. Hi, Linda, you're cutting out. Do you wanna try uh, just turning off your video for a short period and seeing if that helps? Just bear with us, folks. We're gonna. We, it looks like we've uh, lost Linda. Likely some technical connection issues. We'll see if we can get her back. Perhaps this is an opportunity for all the participants. If you had any questions, just. Uh, to let us know in your chat. And when Linda returns, we'll make sure we get to all your questions. Thank you for your patience. We'll just uh, try and get Linda back online. There she is. Okay. Hi, Linda. Welcome back. Uh, I think the. Uh, Do you hear us, happened. Linda? Oh, there. No, I hear we're, you. we're still online. Sorry. Welcome back. I'm yeah, yeah, my internet, my internet got uh, canceled, and uh, okay. Well, anyway, that was disconnected, so now I'm on my phone. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, so now I can't do my slides. Uh, Linda, so you would you need... like me to share your your slides? Please, please yeah. So we're on uh, the time of fear. Sorry about that, everyone. And you know, the pleasures of uh, doing all of this. We're just glad to have you back, Linda, so that's fine. <laughs> uh, so I always have my phone uh, very close by. Yeah, that's right. Oh. So that's still an option. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, as I mentioned, the time of fear was done by Mary Opossumai. Mary Opossumai was the key investigator during the SARS commission with uh, Justice Archie Campbell. And uh, he really became uh, concerned what was happening in our healthcare system. Start working with us. We have um, 
a, an underground a group of experts on occupational uh, occupational health and safety, workplace safety, that are working with us uh, when we push our issues. So he and his uh, team uh, did this investigative report. Uh, what we did was paid for it. That was it. I really wanted it to be uh, independent because I wanted it more than Linda Silas is worried. Uh, I wanted the science of the SARS commission and moving on. So that came out. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, we did progress on the PPEs. Every province has either a policy or a negotiated agreement uh, on if a nurse or healthcare worker does the point of care risk assessment and determines that he or she needs a N95 respirator because believe it's airborne, they will get it. The big success was last week, the courts. So imagine it had to go through the court system in Quebec where now it's mandatory. If a healthcare workers, and it doesn't matter what kind of healthcare workers, uh, is in a red zone, like in a hospital intensive care where there's COVID patient, they must wear the N95 respirator or more. So that's uh, that was good. Uh, next slide. So the recovery, we talked about it a bit, uh, but key here is what are we going to do with our workplace? And a lot of people are saying that uh, 2021 will be similar as 2020. So good or bad, uh, at least it gives us a year to work on how we're going to do our workplace because we're hearing that uh, people are still going into nursing. But what we're hearing as a union is they don't want to have full-time jobs. So that's scary when a uh, young, youngish uh, person cannot work 35 hours a week, uh, maybe 37 in some province, but that's a full-time job. We have a big problems, my friends. Uh, and what we have to look at is what employers are doing is more mandatory overtime or balancing their rotation with overtime shifts. We have to work on that uh, a lot uh, uh, stronger and trying to find language and practices to give a work-life balance to all the workplace. So you'll see here, uh, one the number one issue that we have to bring back is the new grad initiatives. Uh, we have to bring them back across the country, uh, extended health benefits for healthcare workers, peer support program, which I've talked about it uh, before. And we have to have, uh, I saw Arma Jean uh, just flicked in the chat, but uh, uh, RNAO, uh, ONA were very strong in the 2001-2002 report of the Canadian Nursing Advisory Committee, where it was recommended that uh, we had 70% of our workforce full-time. We still need that. And we need to bring those kind of recommendations back to government. Of course, uh, zero tolerance, zero violence in the workplace goes on. Next slide. Uh, the uh, key and the public is on our side is the tra strategies that happen in long-term care. We have to phase out the for-profit in long-term care. We have to guarantee the 4.5 hours of direct care per resident. And that is direct paid care per residence uh, and making sure that it is secure and safe there. Hospital, the staffing, it has to be based and what we call base staffing uh, and uh, with a need assessment, which mean if there's a spike into patient acuity, you have to have a system. In the old days, it was just called the float team, but you have to have a system that is ready to go help those nurses, that nursing team when there's a spike in acuity. And as I mentioned earlier, the uh, violence. So I think I'm done. I'm in Q&A. Next slide. There. Donata, it's well, back you. to you. <laughs> thank you very much, Linda, for a very thought-provoking presentation. And uh, we have some questions uh, for you. And uh, so I'm going to start with the questions. Uh, first, uh, with Suzanne Harrison. And I know that she's presented her question earlier, so, but uh, you've spoken to some of this, but you might have mm -hmm. uh, further thoughts around how can you develop resiliency with such a negative picture in relation to the stats that you were providing as part of their survey mm -hmm. results? Yeah. You know, uh, we've been doing surveys on nurses 
forever. One thing that we always find is nurses love their job. They love doing, they love being a nurse. They, but they want more than the hero symbols. They, they hate their working condition. So we need to work on working condition. And as a union leader, we can't do that by ourselves. Uh, you know, collective agreements are signed by two parties. They're signed by the employer and by the union. Uh, and if you're not ready to call a general strike, you need to work with your employer to improve the working condition. But we always have to remember that nurses love being nurses. And that's what is saving us as a healthcare system, but what's saving us as a profession too. Uh, and Let's be honest, eh? a lot, I made a presentation to the finance minister and health minister just recently, and it was in health human resources, we've used the whack-a-mole uh, method for years. Every time there's a problem, whack it, a few little bit of money, a few study, poof, it's gone. We've never looked other than in uh, 1999 to 2001, look at the whole system and what did we need as nurses, what did we need? So we need to redo that also. But what governments, and I put governments with an S, have done, especially during this pandemic, is that they've abused our goodwill. They know that as a profession, we love what we do. We didn't become nurses just because it was a great job and a great salary. There was something about nursing that attracted to us, and they've abused that. And what they're going to realize when the crisis is done, I've often called it uh, the pandemic as a code 99. And for those of you who've worked on code 99, well, you don't have time to think of anything else. There's no heartbeat. There's an, he's, he or she's not breathing. Fix that and then figure out what's wrong with him. And that's what's happening now. Everyone is under code 99. We have to take care of COVID-19 patients and we have to hurry up and do it now, pushing the vaccine out. And we'll figure out the solutions later, but the solution will rest in working condition. Thank you. Uh, Irma Jean Badjok is asking uh, in regards to the requirement for the N95s. Mm -hmm. uh, read, is this requirement for N95s the same in any sector? And you're caring for a COVID positive resident. Oh, okay. yes. Uh, yeah. The N95, we have uh, our machines from Ontario. So we have a, the strong directive five in Ontario, and it's for every uh, healthcare worker. They, it still says you need to do your point of care risk assessment. I say, if you're not sure, wear the N95. If there is a COVID 19 positive or presumed positive around you within that two meter, where the N95, no question asked. Thank you. And from Suzanne Harrison, she says, my daughter is graduating as an RN and doesn't want to work full-time at the beginning. And she likes mm -hmm. the idea of additional preceptor support. Yeah. And that's the, um, what did I, did I call it? The, uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> The new grads initiative here. I was just looking for the right the language. In 2008-ish, uh, every good initiative in nursing stopped when we hit a uh, recession in 2008. And there was a new grad initiative. It still exists in Ontario and only in Ontario, where an employer can sign on and say, for example, I need four new grads. They will be working with a mentor and they'll be supernumerary. So they will be either six months, nine months. I think the maximum, or Jean could correct me, but the, the maximum was uh, nine months. And they're working in a supernumerary. They're being paid their salary to get into the swing of things. It was amazing programs. We used to have them across the country, but amazing programs because it was rewarding for the mentor to have the time. And the mentor would also have a reduced patient load. So it's bringing back that balance. So that's on top of our list when we discuss uh, with health ministers and provincial uh, and the federal government, they need to look at that uh, because they have to question like I do, like Suzanne might do, why can't a new grad work or why doesn't a new grad want to work 35 mm -hmm. hours a week? Mm -hmm. And, and that's that kind of the key. sounds like an excellent strategy. 
Yeah. So I invite others to, if you have any questions or comments, to uh, please let us know in the chat. Uh, while we'll be waiting for those, I just, you know, um, coming from an academic environment, Linda, uh, nurse, nursing educators are certainly facing many challenges as they're mm. working from home and teaching remotely, supporting students uh, virtually, and at the same time having many, you know, personal family responsibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we're certainly starting to hear more about mental health issues. I just wonder if you can make any further comments in terms of how we best support our educators uh, during this time mm -hmm. in terms of their mental health support. Well, um, I think you're a dean, eh? Be nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's it's be nice. Uh, you know, okay, I'm not a dean and I'm not a, a, a professor either, but I just look at my little team at the beginning I was trying to keep everything so normal because for in my situation, nurses pay our salaries and I had to keep our office working like I wanted. I was in the office constantly, constantly, constantly. I needed to keep a normalcy and then realized these are not normal times. My, I have a young team. They have children at home. They have sick parents. They like, OK. How do we do this differently? So now we have a mixture of some go in, we have a schedule, you know, and, and some will call us someday and say, I just need to get out of my house. Please make sure the office is open. I won't touch anything. I won't. And we have to do that. So, so it is uh, changing the way of what productivity is. And when mm -hmm. our team is happy and feels supported, they're more productive. And I think it's the same thing, either a professor in nursing or a, a teacher in the school system. Right. I can't imagine being a teacher in the school system and not mm -hmm. knowing uh, from one month to another what kind of tools you're going to be utilizing to teaching children. And the same mm -hmm. thing for all of you. Uh, so uh, and then we're going to have fi to find ways on how we're going to give these people vacation. Mm -hmm. Because I guarantee you March break for whoever has children at March break, it's not a vacation this year. Uh, it's, you, you know, we can be creative and say, oh, go outside, make a snowman. Uh, it's not a vacation because you've had these lovely children uh, for the last 12 months, almost underneath your skirt. Yeah, thank you for that. And Irma Jean is just following up to say, I believe you're correct and great. Mm -hmm. You're focusing on this as we're wanting to expand this as well in terms of the uh, preceptor support. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I invite any, if there's any further questions or comments uh, from our participants, now would be the time just to let us know what, what your question is. I think overall, you know, many um, nurse leaders and employers are really looking to see uh, what can we do at this point just to really promote uh, well-being amongst our, you know, mm -hmm workplace uh, team. And yeah. um, certainly from my perspective as well, we're always looking, how can we best support faculty and staff and students? And so I think it is very timely to have this presentation on the mental health aspects, just to see how we can further support everyone's uh, mental well-being. Yeah. One thing, if I can add, is uh, as a profession, uh, we'll have to make sure we don't water down our uh, nursing expectations. And that uh, worries me if you, uh, you're from Manitoba, uh, you yeah. know there's a pilot project in Manitoba for uh, critical care, COVID critical care area, where they put one nurse as a quarterback. And yeah. instead of a one-on-one -on -one that she can have, or he can have one on five, one on six with other members of the team to come and help that never worked in intensive care before. Uh, those are dangerous situations. And uh, as a, a group of leaders in nursing, we have to make sure that that doesn't become the norm. Uh, we know about, uh, regardless if you're for or against the nurse-patient ratios, everyone is for safe staffing component. And, uh, you know, I'll, uh, I'll take Arma Jean's line, uh, quote here because she's listening, but the sicker you are, the more experienced nurse you need, the more qualified nurse you need. And, and that is a simple golden rule that we've researched, we've put policies on for years and years and years, 
and it cannot be a pandemic or the fear of working full time and an extreme shortage because we're going to have an extreme shortage that going to dilute our patient safety standards. Yeah. Thank you, Linda. And Rajin, just further commenting that, um, Linda, what are ways you think faculty can best support students who are anxious about their learning and want to be in clinical education? So there's a bit of an issue, mm -hmm. right? And going into clinical, mm -hmm. there is the fear of, of, of exposure and yet uh, that mm -hmm. still a, a really good learning environment and you also wanna be there to support the patients, right? And so yeah. there's a bit of a dilemma. Yeah, the, the, the exposure issue shouldn't be a, you know, it's a concern for anybody walking into a healthcare facility. Uh, but uh, our position and our position with the federal and provincial territorial governments have been, regardless if you're a student or a doctor, uh, if you're entering those hot zones, you have to have the training and the proper PPE. So Absolutely. the exposure shouldn't be there. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the key is the fear of not being ready. Uh, and that it's only your expertise as uh, professors mm -hmm. that can deal with that. But I think if we talk to them about what is what can be tomorrow, like the new grads initiative, uh, we're and for them to know we're doing it, you know, we're having meetings with the federal health minister now. Uh, okay, this is 2021, we're in it. Uh, how are we going to get out of it uh, still uh, with a strong nursing workforce? And the number one initiative is keeping those new grads uh, stable and willing and, and safe and satisfied to be nurse, a nurse for the next 40 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And Suzanne Harrison is saying, we created an Atlantic Deans and Directors of Nursing to help support each other. And another great strategy. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's one of the reasons with the Wellness Together Canada that we're working on these peer groups uh, of nurses. Um, there's exercise on all our website. Even our convention is going to be, see if a news convention will be virtually, will be on Facebook. Uh, uh, what June 8 and 9 and we're doing things I've never done before you know yoga sessions and laughter yeah. sessions and because even if it's virtually you have to find ways uh, to connect and you have to find ways to laugh yes exactly well thank you very much Linda for an excellent presentation very thought-provoking and stimulating and generated a good discussion and good questions and thank and you, so, everyone, for your participation here today. I was just going to say thank you, and uh, thank you for your patience with the technology. We still don't have internet in the house. so <laughs> I'm just glad you were able to, to return and continue the discussion, which has been very Good. helpful. So I just want to note that the recording of this session will be made available on CASM's YouTube channel and circulated to you in the coming days. So uh, please feel free to share the link within your networks. So thank you again. Uh, we hope you will consider attending the, the last session of this year's Lunch and Learn series, which is set for March 17th on the theme of supporting at-risk populations. So please visit chasm.ca for more information and have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Stay bye. safe. Stay strong. Bye. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, Nita. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.